Let me invite you to take your scripture and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 6. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 6. We'll be looking at uh, verse 25 through verse 34. And uh, I want to bring to you a message that uh, I've titled, I Know About Tomorrow. I Know About Tomorrow. Now the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. But if you're a child of God, you know already about tomorrow. And I want us to look at this for just a few moments. Look at verse 25. Jesus said, therefore, I say unto you. You know what they used to tell us in Bible college? Every time you read that word, therefore, you need to stop and see what it's there for. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? You know what I've learned about the fowls of the air? I love to watch birds. Amen. And so we've got some bird feeders that we've got outside our big picture window outside right there next to my office. And then we've got two on the other side that we've got a few bird feeders. And if you keep feed in those feeders, birds will find them. You know that? Amen. They'll find those feeders. Uh, so God always provides. And it's amazing to watch some of the birds and what they do uh, whenever there's no feed in the feeders. Try not to ever let it run out, but it happens from time to time. And they'll continue to work. We had some bluebirds. We got some bluebird boxes out there also. And it was amazing to watch those bluebirds work and take care of their little ones. So God takes care of the fowls of the air. Now notice verse 27. It says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take your thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, and neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall... He not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Then notice what Jesus says. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Thank you, Lord, for the words of our Savior. And help us with confidence see that we can know about tomorrow. Now you tell us in this last scripture to take no thought for the morrow. But God, if we've been saved by your marvelous grace, we know what tomorrow holds for us. Bless these words and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Friend, there is nothing more fearful and dreadful than torment that comes on us whenever we think about the subject of tomorrow. I mean, already everybody's talking about the subject that's going to begin Tuesday. Uh, somebody mentioned Virginia and what's going to be going on there tomorrow. Everybody's worried that civil war may break out and that things can get really, really bad. And if things do get bad, it's simply because people can be bad. Amen. Amen. And uh, there's no doubt about that. I, and y'all know how I know that? Uh, because I'm one of you. Amen. Amen. People can be bad. But you see, people live in fears and dread of things that happen. I remember visiting with a family one time who had much going on uh, in their lives whenever I was serving as a chaplain with the hospice. And uh, this one particular gentleman, and you've heard it before, but it would do good to put it in here again because you need to be reminded of this. But this one gentleman, uh, he was a chronic worrier. He worried all the time. And uh, I looked at him one day and I said, you know, I don't know why you are so worried uh, about things that you have no control over whatsoever. And I said, besides that, I said, uh, don't you know that statistics prove that 90% of the things that you worry about don't never come to pass. Amen. Well, I thought I was doing something right and good. You know what he said to me? Well, preacher, I'm not worried about the 90% of stuff that don't come to pass. It's the 10% that does come to pass that worries me. <laughs> he was a chronic worrier. We live in such terror of what may happen, what's going to happen, disasters that may await us, what disappointments may come our way and overtake us, what evil will overwhelm us. You see, we all take thoughts of all of these things what does Jesus say to us about this? If you look at verse 34, he says, therefore, now let's see what it's there for. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought things of itself. But yet we find ourselves devastated about what could happen Tomorrow, Well, preacher, how will it affect my life? I wish that I could stand here and tell you that uh, there'll never be anything that'll come into your life that will affect you tomorrow. But I can't do that because you see, there are things that happen in this life that will affect us. And uh, the thing is, whenever the storm comes, you got to remember that you serve a God that's much bigger than the storm. I mean, do you remember the disciples? They were worried to death about the storm that was about to swallow up their boat. Jesus wasn't worried about the storm because the Bible says he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep. Do y'all remember that? And the disciples ran to the back and shook him because they were worried about what was about to happen to them. And uh, I mean, I can just hear them as they scream, and I would scream right here, but I can't. <laughs> I, I mean, they, they, I mean, they were concerned, and I believe they, they really very loudly carest not that we are about to perish. And Jesus arose. Now, I've often wondered how he was sleeping in the hinder part of the ship whenever waves were coming up over the ship. It's easy, brother. It's easy. <laughs> well, there's a Navy man right there. He said it's easy. He, 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 a Navy veteran right there. He says it's easy. I've never been on one, so I don't know. But anyway, 
Uh, the Navy man says it's easy. But Jesus is in the hinder part of the ship asleep. Waves coming up over the boat. And he gets up and he says, O oh, ye of little faith. Walks to the front of the boat. I believe he holds his hands up. I, I don't know whether he did or not. But he said, peace be still. And the storm subsided. It quit. And the Bible says that they were amazed that they served such a man as this that even controlled the winds and the waves. There is not one storm that you will ever face in your life that will take God by surprise. I want you to know that. Not one. Now I remember my dear sweet granddaddy. He's been with the Lord for a long time. Granddaddy Buford. I, I loved him. He was, he was like a a second daddy to me. And uh, Granddaddy Buford, whenever he was diagnosed with lung cancer, I remember, Granddaddy always had a good sense of humor. And I remember the doctor coming in and telling Granddaddy that he wasn't going to live uh, but six months. Granddaddy, he just says, oh, I'm going to live. He said, I'm not going to die. He said, I'm going to live. And he made his little joke out of the whole matter and the doctor took offense at it and said, Mr. Shiflet, I'm talking about your life here. And I won't ever forget what my granddaddy told him. He said, that's right, doctor, you're talking about my life. And he says, I'm not going to live sad because I'm going to die. He said, I'm going to enjoy the six months that I got left and enjoy my family. And said, then whenever it's all over, he said, I'm going to be with my Lord. And uh, he lived six months to the day, the very day, lived six months to the day, and he went to be with the Lord. And I remember going in there and talking to Big Pa. That's what we called him. We went in there and talked to Big Pa, and I said, Big Pa, I said, let me ask you. I said, are you afraid to die? And he said, no, I'm not afraid to die. He said, I just hate to leave y'all. That was the way he said it. Because I love you so much. And I remember as a young boy looking at him and saying, well, Big Paul, you need to know that I'll be there soon. I'll see you again soon. And it wasn't many days after that that he went to be with the Lord. But you see, things like that should not frighten us if we're a child of God. God is so much bigger than any storm that we'll ever face in this life. Now, there are several things that I want us to see whenever I tell you that I know about tomorrow. First of all, I want you to know that tomorrow will be the product of our todays. Now, did you catch that? Tomorrow will be the product of our todays. You need to understand, friend, that we live in a world which is governed by God, which means that there are no such things as accidents. No such things. Now, don't misunderstand me. I realize that there's wrecks and those type things and but there, there's none of this that takes God by surprise. I've already told you that. Now, if today, if today we would invest honestly and, and with a heart filled with effort and sincerity, uh, with an upright heart, and place a devout confidence in God, all of these things will bear natural fruit in our tomorrow. You see, God can take your accident and use it for His glory. Amen. You know that? God can take your accident and use it for His glory. I've been able in my ministry to see God take the death of someone's loved one and use it for His glory to win some of the family to the Lord. Amen. Now, that's the miracle of tomorrow. Amen? And God can do that. So, tomorrow will be the product of our todays. Now, secondly, 
I want you to understand that goodwill proves more efficient than evil. Goodwill proves to be more efficient than evil. In the last analysis, evil, listen, is nothing but a rebellion against God. Every time that you commit some type of evil, you are rebelling against God. And you need to understand that. And you need to understand that God sees your rebellious activity. He knows exactly when you are doing evil. Now, I wish that I could sit here, or stand here rather, I'm not sitting. <laughs> I wish that I could stand here and tell you that, that uh, you won't ever be evil. But you see, I can't do that because you know yourself better than I do. And uh, I, I've tried to live myself uh, a life above reproach. But you know what I've learned? I'm like Paul. Some of the things that I ought not to do are the things that I do. And uh, the things that I ought to do, I don't do. And uh, I, I've, I've learned to say with Paul, I'm just the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. So I'm not perfect. Now, I know, I know that some of you are shocked by hearing that. <laughs> I know that you just cannot believe your ears. I know you thought that you had a perfect preacher. You had a perfect preacher, but you don't. I am not perfect. Not yet, anyway. God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. So in the last analysis, evil is a rebellion against God. It is a disobedience to God's will. It is a failure to cooperate with God. Now listen to me. I know that sometimes y'all got to wonder where I get some of my messages. Because this is rather an unusual title I know about tomorrow. But uh, uh, I do read a good bit and uh, I search a good bit and I find things that interest me. And uh, today I was kind of listening to some of the concert that you went to, Nancy, last night because we didn't get to go. We, we celebrated my son's birthday. That'll be Tuesday. And then my grandson, uh, his birthday will be uh, Thursday. And... Uh, uh, the granddaughter's birthday will be Thursday. And uh, then John Mark was there. His birthday will be in March, so they won't be back down. So we, sell it, we threw him in there too. So we celebrated four birthdays. So we didn't get to go to the singing last night, but I listened to some of it today. And I listened to Dan Allen Taylor talk about that old bus that they travel in. And, and, and one of the things that amazed and it took me back to, to the Angel series. You know, uh, he said that uh, they were trying to cross that last big old hill at Silva. They had blown a head gasket. Water was leaking. And he said that he had that bus on the floor. And as they was climbing that hill, said it was doing about 30 mile an hour. And it was getting slower and slower and slower. And he said a big old Greyhound bus just passed them like they were sitting still. He said, I looked at those girls and he said, girls, y'all better start praying. He said, we're in trouble. And he said, them girls went to praying and he said, he was shocked. He said, because the Holy Ghost of God filled that bus. Amen. And he said, he, he said, I didn't see no angel. He said, but I could just feel them wings. <laughs> he said, I don't know whether it got behind the bus and pushed the bus or what. Says, but we went over that hill and passed that Graham bus <laughs> that that, uh, that, that passed us. And he said, they told me I needed to watch and make sure that there was plenty of water in the bus because we didn't want to show enough to tear the bus up. Said, I got it to Douglas, Georgia. Said, hadn't put a drop of water in it after we crossed that hill. Said, said hadn't put a drop in it. And said, the man uh, was going to fix the head gas. And said, he started draining water. And said, he just kept draining water and kept draining water. Said he went over there and looked and he said, that reservoir's still full of water. I can't believe 
believe that bus has got this much water in it. Friends, God's real. Amen. You know what done that for that group? I believe with all my heart. Prayer did that. Prayer did that. That group will be here, by the way, the first Sunday in March. And I'm looking forward to having them. Now listen to me. I don't know about you, but if we prepare to do decent, how many of you want to do decent? All right, I hear a few people say, I want to do real, real good. I, Connor, do you want to do decent? I didn't see your hand go up, Connor. <laughs> now, now, you better look out because uh, I see a, a, a mom and daddy back there that might get you and a grandpa and a grandma back there, so you better do decent. Emily, did your hand go up? You want to do decent? I saw your hand, it went up. <laughs> we all want to do decent. Now, if we prepare to do decent, the honest, upright, and fair, and godly things tomorrow, then we can be sure that the best possible results will follow our efforts. If you want to do good, God's going to help you do good. Amen. Now, God will take tomorrow, my friend, if I let go of it, and let him determine what goes on in his will for our life. You know why some people don't have a good tomorrow? Because they want to follow their will instead of God's will. God's got a perfect will for your life. God's got a perfect plan for your life. But you see, the thing is, we've got a plan too. We've got a plan too. We do. Now, when Brother Stanley decided to retire from First Baptist Church, Nashville, they rolled me from my associate pastor's role to the uh, transitional interim role. And uh, that really excited me. Uh, all of my senior adults that I had ministered to at First Baptist Church, they all began to come to me and say, Preacher, you need to give a resume to this church. We want you to be our next pastor. Well, I, listening to my senior adults, I submitted a resume to the church. They already knew me. I'd been there a year and a half. But they wanted a resume anyway, so I gave them one. And uh, felt secure that I would not have any problems because what I do and my ministry spoke for itself. But I was devastated when the search committee wrote me off. You see, I had my agenda. I had my plan. But you see, God had a different plan. And, and it's amazing to watch people God's plan uh, come into being. Now, I wish that I could tell you that, that God always works for everybody this fast, but He doesn't. He really doesn't, but, but He did for me. The day that uh, the uh, chairman of the personnel committee dropped by my office to let me know that they had called their pastor and that uh, they was working up a severance package for me. Uh, they didn't want me to stay because if I stayed, I would be the pastor, but he would have the title. So they wanted me to leave. That man hadn't walked out of my office two minutes and my phone rang and Bethany Hospice hired me over the telephone. Two days later, I opened up a Facebook page that I hadn't opened in over probably six, seven months. I'd canceled it. And I don't know why, something just told me to open that page and there was a message from uh, Barry to give him a call uh, that, that this church needed a pastor. And, and so God brought all of that together. I, I mean, that was God's perfect plan for my life at that particular time. And God's got a perfect plan for your life. I mean, it, it amazed me to see God's hand in all of that in the way that it, it took place. But the problem with most of us is we don't want to follow God's plan. We want to follow our plan. 
Now, thirdly, listen. Tomorrow will contain its share of trouble. Did you hear me? Tomorrow will contain its share of trouble. I'm having trouble right now. I mean, think about it. I'm trying to talk to you and you having to listen to me with a squeaky voice. So I'm having a little bit of trouble right now. So, so tomorrow, tomorrow will contain its share of trouble. There is no way, listen, there is no way by which any person can escape disappointments and difficulties. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have, you shall have tribulation. What does that mean? That means trouble's coming. And listen to me, if you've never had any trouble yet, Hold on. Trouble's coming. It is. I don't know what form it may come in. I don't know what may happen. But trouble's coming. But I'm glad Jesus didn't stop there. He said, but be of good cheer. That's a, boy, that's a good place for a but right there. I mean, there's some times that we don't want to hear that word but. But. Well, Brother Danny, I like you, but. And that's when you don't want to hear it. But now Jesus put a, a good but right here. But be of good cheer. For I have overcome this world. So difficulties, oppositions, and burdens will come. Now, listen. They are likewise the conditions that God will use to produce new strength in you new wisdom in you, and to give you a godly character. One of the greatest misconceptions of living and walking the Christian life in the United States of America is, well, praise God, I'm a Christian now. I will never have any more problems. Honey, let me just go ahead and tell you now. Your problems are just starting. Because you see, the devil had you where he wanted you before you got saved. But now you've got saved and you better bet he's going to come after you. So you need to understand that God will use all of these things that you may go through, this trouble that you may face, to strengthen you, to give you wisdom, and to build a godly character in you. To seek an escape from such is to retreat from life and to miss God's best. Now, I can't tell you that I enjoyed some of the trials that I've been through. I can't tell you that it was fun to go through some of the things that I've had to face in this life. But I can tell you now as I look back on those times, I wondered whenever I was going through those times, where is God? God, where are you? And let me just tell you how human I really am. There was one time I even said, God, do you know who I am? Like he didn't know. I said, let me remind you of all the good that I've done for your kingdom. Boy, that was a mistake. Because God spoke to my heart and said, let me remind you of all the things that you haven't done that I told you to do. My knees hit the floor. And I cried a puddle of tears in repentance. And I said, God, I'm sorry. But I thank God for every one of those trials now because it helped to strengthen me. It helped to give me wisdom to talk to others that may be going through something similar to what I went through in my life. And uh, God will use that. It, it gave me Christian character that I didn't have uh, before it happened. 
I wish that I could tell you it wasn't that way, but it's not. If I were to ask some of you, some of you, you've had storms in your life. My goodness, when my youngest son was playing football at uh, Tiff County High School, playing on the ninth grade team, the team that they had picked to be their next prospective state championship team because of the size of the line and because of the talent of the running backs and the good quarterback. Oh man, I, I was so excited until I found out that the whole football team was strung out on drugs. And I'd ask God, why? Why, God? You, why'd you let that happen to my son? That's my boy, God. But you know what? I thank God for every one of those trials that I went through with that boy because I sat in many classes that taught me things about addiction and some of the things that those guys face that I would have never known if I hadn't went through that. And I'm thankful to say that my son is recovered today. Amen. And every time I see some of his old counselors that used to minister to him, they'll say, Daniel's one of our success stories. And I often think about that. And I asked the lady one day, I said, let me ask you something. I said, what is the statistics of recovery? Two in ten. Did you hear that? Two in ten recover. Today I'm glad to say that my son Daniel is a lieutenant with the Tifton Police Department. And now he's helping people deal with some of the problems that they're going through that he went through himself. You see, God takes those circumstances and He uses them. And He uses all of those things. Number four, tomorrow, listen, tomorrow will be lived one minute at a time. Did you hear that? One minute at a time. And you know, we could break it down and say one second at a time. But you need to understand that uh, they, they wrote that song, One Day at a Time, Sweet Jesus. And I like that song. That's a good song. And we need to live our life one day at a time. But listen, today, today, it does not have to be faced all at once. All at once. What are you talking about, preacher? The difficulties of every minute that you have to face as they arrive also brings with it a quota of God's strength if you'll accept that strength. Yes. God wants to strengthen you. Yes, the devil wants to kill you, but God wants to strengthen you. And the devil will kill you if you let him. Did you hear what I just said? He will kill you. The Bible, Jesus said the devil's come to steal to kill, and to destroy. And He'll do that if you let Him. But then the Lord said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Don't give the devil power to kill you. Satan has no more power over you than you'll let him have. And I mean, if God takes the hedge down, there's one thing Satan can't touch if you're a child of God. Your life. Go to the book of Job. The devil told God, says, you got a fence built around him. Say, but if you'll drop that fence, fence, if you'll drop that hedge of protection, he'll curse you to your face. God said, well, do what you want to to him. He says, you can do everything you want to to him, but what? Can't take his life. That's right. Can't take his life. And you see, let me tell you something. The devil might be able to put a lot of whooping on you. But always remember this. If you'll suit up in the whole armor of God, you've got victory over him. God has given to us means to overcome the enemy. And that means to overcome the enemy is the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and the list goes on and on and on. But the problem is, now, you know, you know why most most Christians who are taking a beating by Satan today are getting whipped down. They forgot to suit up in their armor. Now, uh, tonight is supposed to be thirty degrees, and I know my wife. 
real well. There will come a time that our Mama Preta's little dog, Lily, who lives with us now, there will come a time that she's going to need to go outside. It's going to be 30 degrees tonight. And Marta will say, Honey, honey, you need to take Lily out. Now, if I get up out of my chair and I go to take Lily out without putting on my coat, I'm not going to stay out there very long. But now if I suit up in that coat and I'll already be changed out of this attire that I'm wearing now, I'll have on my little sweatsuit because she freezes me to death in the house. So I'll have that on and then put my coat on on top of it. I'll be all right to take Lily out. But you see, listen to me. That's exactly what children of God are doing whenever they walk outside in this world without suiting up in the whole armor of God. And that's exactly why they, they, they get defeated. So live out your life one minute at a time and trust God with it. And then last of all, number five, strength will be provided for tomorrow or strength will be to provided tomorrow for tomorrow. Now, listen, we may be quite sure uh, that anything which must be done tomorrow will be done with the strength of which tomorrow will bring. I always used to say whenever, I mean, I, y'all probably heard me preach it here. Uh, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. And I, I, I've said it many times. When tomorrow gets here, what's it going to be? Today. So I always say, you know, tomorrow probably won't ever come because when it gets here, it's today. But then I titled this sermon, I Know About Tomorrow. And I know about tomorrow because alongside the task for which you and I are responsible uh, for handling by focusing on God and keeping our eyes on Him, there will be strength, His strength, there will be power, His power, awaiting us with which to discharge the responsibilities that he's trusted to us. You see, I didn't get up this morning and walk out of this world in my strength. I walk out into this world in my strength. Right before we started coming, I was listening to some of the concert from last night, as I've already shared, and uh, two of Marta's students uh, sing with that group or well the Hardeman boy is a preacher now so he don't sing with them a whole lot but usually at the anniversary sing they always call him up and get him to sing Marta taught the Hardeman boy and she also taught Dan Allen Taylor and uh, so when they brought the Hardeman boy up to sing bass for him and uh, they sang that song boy it just got all up under my skin you know I got a little bit emotional and I kind of turned over there and uh, I says they asked Darren to sing with them, you know, just Marta looked at me and she says, how are you going to preach tonight? Says, how are you going to be able to preach tonight? Said, said, you don't have any voice. Says, you need to call them and just tell them that we won't have church tonight. I said, oh no. I said, God will strengthen me. I said, I'm going to go preach. I said, I've got to preach. Let me tell you something, I run a revival three weeks in a row one time when I was a young preacher. I don't know that I could do that anymore. I don't know if I could hold up to do that. A lot of people don't understand what preaching takes out of a man of God, but uh, it, it's a joyous time when you're up here doing it. But let me tell you something, when you, when you come down from the Holy Spirit, uh, it, it, your body's just worn. And I preached revival at three different churches for three weeks in a row. Uh, a number of years ago. And uh, y'all know I've always had a voice and exerted my voice in my preaching. And by the end of the first week, I didn't have much voice left. And Brother Roscoe Bennett told me what to do. And I did it. It helped. But I preached for three weeks. And I'm going to tell you something. I've never, 
ever that I know of not been able to preach because of my voice. Now, I've coughed and hacked through some of my sermons, but God's always provided. You see, God will always give you the strength if you'll trust in Him to give you the strength to handle the responsibility that He's trusted to you. We don't need to be concerned about that whatsoever. God provides for us the power in advance for our needs. But uh, we do not sense the fact that we have that power until we actually attempt the task. Now, I'll be very honest with you. I didn't know that I was going to be able to bring this message tonight. But God has blessed me. And we've been able to bring the message. And I didn't know that I'd been talking for 40 minutes. But I just looked down at this little recording that I'm doing and I've been talking for 40 minutes. My wife tells me sometimes I just don't know when to hush. I can't... who said amen? I said amen. Keep going. Keep going. I thought that was it back right then. <laughs> oh, amen. Well, listen to me. Listen to me. You can know about your tomorrow if you're a child of God. Now, I've already let you know that even when tomorrow gets here, it'll be today. And I've already let you know that when it gets here, that you're not going to be without trouble. But you serve a God that's bigger than your storm. Always trust in Him. Always rely upon Him. And He'll help you at any given moment for whatever you have to face in this life. Stand with me if you will. Father, I love you. And I just give you praise that you spared the old preacher's voice tonight. And that you used it. Now God, I can't look into the hearts of your people. You know us all better than we know ourselves. Help us, God, to examine ourselves and see if there's some type of decision or commitment we need to make and then help us do that. In Jesus' name, amen.